Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming out on this humid June day. We're in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium for History is Lunch. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. A few things to know about. Tomorrow at 6 p.m. will be the next in the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum's Under the Light series featuring movement veterans Meredith Anding Jr., Hezekiah Watkins, and Dolores Lynch Williams. And then we'll have two children's programs this week as well. Tomorrow at 3 p.m. will be story time on the side porch at the Adora Wealthy House and Garden. That's free, co-sponsored by Lemuria Books. Then on Friday at 11 a.m. is another of the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum's Read, Engage, and Discover series, this time featuring WLBT television anchor Maggie Wade. Join us for those. And I hope that you will be back with us next week for History's Lunch when Christopher Spann will be our speaker. He will talk about his book, From Cotton Field to Schoolhouse, African-American Education in Mississippi, 1862 to 1875. Today, we're delighted to welcome back Roger Ward, who will present a closer look, silhouette artists in antebellum Mississippi. Roger Ward is deputy director and chief curator of the Mississippi Museum of Art, with more than 30 years of curatorial <clears throat> management and teaching experience. A native of Wichita, Kansas, Ward graduated from the University of Kansas with a double major in the history of art and the history of Europe in the Renaissance. He studied as a Marshall Scholar, Chester Dale Fellow, and Crest Foundation Fellow at the Courtauld Institute of Art of the University of London, from which he received both his MA and PhD degrees in 16th century European art. Ward has lectured at museums around the world, from New York to London to Sydney, and at venues in the United States, states such as the Frick Collection, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the J. Paul Getty Museum. Help me welcome Roger Ward. Okay, so we've got this hooked up, it sounds like, right? You can hear, hear me all right? Thank you, Chris, very much for that welcome. And I'm very glad to be here today and to say hello to all of you, some of whom I know from the museum, of course, and many others. Glad to have you here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, one of the exhibitions that is on view at the Art Museum right now until the middle of August, so if you haven't had a chance to come over and have a look, we hope you will do so. You may not know the museum is now open and free to the public all the, all the time. There's no, there's no charge anymore either for admission or for the exhibitions. So that makes it much more e accessible and easy for anybody and everybody to come. The exhibition, the main exhibition, is entitled Blackout. Silhouettes Then and Now, organized by the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, and it features one aspect of their collection, which is more famous, I'm sure, for the paintings that it preserves of famous Americans of, of all types. But one of the subsets of their collection in their prints, drawings, photographs, in other words, works on paper division, is about 185 silhouettes. They have another three or four hundred profiles. The distinction being that profiles, of course, are just the head. You know, just if you're holding, if you have a coin in your pocket, you have a profile in your hand. It's similar to an ancient cameo, of course. Cameos and coins are the way that we know the the physiognomies of many ancient people, also from the Renaissance and and so forth, of course. And silhouette tends to be reserved, not exclusively, but tends to be reserved for the full length, meaning um, not life size, just full length cutouts of an individual. They are shown in profile, of course, but the distinction is one of really that historians and historiographers have applied to the, the same kind of things, just that the profile is like the bust length version and the profile is full length. Well, the exhibition is, is here um, because it seemed like it was one that was interesting in terms of the, the historical aspects of the 19th century that it, that it presents. But about maybe September, 
of last year, Betsy Bradley phoned me up and said, you know, I was kind of surprised when I was walking around, this is her talking, when I was walking around the exhibition in Washington the other day, I kept reading or thinking that there were, these artists had come to the South, that there were examples of these artists that were made in New Orleans and Natchez and so forth and so on, but their exhibition only had two, and they were both anonymous, unnamed, uh, enslaved girls who worked for different owners in New Orleans, and that was it. And she said, aren't there more of these that were made in the South? She said everywhere, she grew up in Greenville, and she said everywhere I went as a child, there were profiles hanging on people's walls, and you saw them for sale, and you know, and this, that, and the other. And what can we do to kind of bring this home to the people who live in Jackson and Mississippi and so forth? And I said, well, give me 30 minutes, you know, let me, <laughs> let me have a little look here. And uh, sure enough, it turned out that there were, there were plenty of examples of sitters from Natchez and or New Orleans that were already in the collection of the National Portrait Gallery. They just didn't include them in this exhibition, you know, in their larger exhibition. So I then uh, simply went to uh, the historic New Orleans collection, of course, in New Orleans in the French Quarter, and, and to the National Portrait Gallery, and was able to then gather up some images of people, persons that were portrayed here, that were, that were cut, were portrayed as silhouettes while these artists were visiting in Mississippi. So that was the subject of this smaller exhibition that I created, whose title is, as you see it here, on the, on the screen. It's like a coda or an epilogue to the larger exhibition. We didn't insert it into the middle of their show. That's not good you know, etiquette in terms of museum behavior, but it, it's literally like a, like a coda. So all of the things that I'm going to show you, you can see they're in the corridor outside the main exhibition. But I thought it was fascinating. I mean, it didn't take long at all to learn that, yes, at least two of the silhouette artists who are known for having worked on the East Coast also came to this part of the world and spent shorter or longer amounts of time. And so trying to work out the chronology of it and figure out who they visited and why and so forth, that was all part of what I was trying to establish. It wasn't long to do it, so it's not as if this is a result of you know, years of research. It's a two or three months on, on my part. So I'm just going to share with you kind of what fell rather quickly into my hand. I've been numerous times in my life to Natchez, but I've never lived there. I'm not Mimi Miller, whom some of you, you know, know from Natchez. In other words, I'm not an expert on the genealogy of every family that's ever lived in Natchez, you know, back to the Middle Ages, um, like, like she is. So you'll forgive me if I get, get anything uh, out of place or mispronounce people's names, and you'll be able to help with that, I suspect. Um, I wanted to put up... <clears throat> One of these examples from the exhibition, this is the kind of use of which uh, profiles were, were made before photography. This, of course, is a profile, the head of a man whose name is Sancho, as you would find if you, if you have a quick read here. And this was made, this comes from a newspaper, a regular broadsheet newspaper, printed in uh, September, September the 21st of 1807, and it advertises the disappearance of an enslaved man named Sancho, whose owner, Winthrop Sargent, had been the first governor of the territory of Mississippi. He was on the, he was on the John Adams side of the political divide, so the minute that Jefferson came into office, then Winthrop Sargent was dismissed, you know, as governor and replaced, but nonetheless, he married in Natchez and uh, the, his wife inherited this house, which has been modified and changed. Uh, that photograph um, called Gloucester, and a uh, house that's been em embellished and added on to. It doesn't look quite like that, but nonetheless, it bears the distinction of being one of the oldest surviving plantation houses in, in uh, Adams, Adams County. And it was called Gloucester because Winthrop Sargent was born in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And so you get a certain amount of confusion in the correspondence between the family, the family members, whether they're talking about Gloucester House or Gloucester, Massachusetts. And that was certainly the case with the, the uh, compilers of the catalog of 
the National Portrait Gallery exhibition who thought that Sancho had gone missing from Gloucester House in Natchez, but that just can't be true because uh, if you look up at the top, you see it says that this was printed in Boston on September the 21st, and then if you read down a little, a little farther into the, right here, actually quite low, you probably can't all see it, but it says that he went missing on the evening of the 17th. Well, in 1807, there was no way for word to get from Boston to New Orleans or anywhere else in four days. Uh, you know, the steamship wasn't even in use yet. And so the long journey by stagecoach and flatboat and, and so forth, it took at least two weeks. I mean, it was a long time to get news from one place to another. So the conclusion is that, that Winthrop Sargent had gone home for a visit, had gone to Boston, and Sancho, his, his very valued and esteemed manservant, had gone with him and then uh, took his leave of Winthrop Sargent while they were in Boston, which of course by that time was already strongly abolitionist and would have been a much more favorable place if you were going to escape, you know, if you were going to leave. Probably better to do it in, in Massachusetts than in Mississippi um, at that moment in time. And in the course of doing this, I was um, just sort of lucky enough to stumble across a letter from one of Winthrop Sargent's sisters, which proved that as of late October, Sancho was still free and presumably had gone to Canada. So that may be the, you know, the course of what happened with him. Um, another kind of, of profile that's in the exhibition is represented by this large, large voluminous album assembled by an artist whose surname is Bache, B-A-C-H-E. He worked in New Orleans throughout the first decade of the 19th century. And he made profiles by cutting, cutting them out of the black sheet of paper and for 25 cents, you got the piece of paper out of which he had cut your profile, and he kept your profile. And so he then, sort of like stamp collecting, stuck them down in these, in these large albums. And then, as you can see, he numbered them. So at the back, there's a concordance. So if I want to know what number 319, if I want to know who that is, then you go to the back of the book. Uh, just like in a Bible or something, you know, you can find out who number 319 is. So they're very, they're very varied and interesting. Uh, but, of course, we can all tell, looking back on them from well over 200 years, that they, I guess, 300 years. Gosh, yes. <laughs> back to the, you know, back to the first, first years of the 19th century, that um, the hairstyles and the clothing and so forth and so on are all indicative of the time. Um, now, we, the real meat of the exhibition called Black Out, though, consists of these silhouettes, which are uh, almost always full length, whether standing or seated. This is by the artist Auguste Edouard, who was the most famous and popular of the silhouettists of 19th century America. He was French, you can tell by the name, and he had a great career in France and in the United Kingdom before he came to America in the year 1839. He stayed two years, and what we know of his work consists of the, or comprises the first five years from 1839 to 1844, and he had made probably about 20,000 of these silhouettes by the time, you know, within that 10-year period at least, uh, because he was very prolific, and we know that in some days he would cut as many as 20 or 30. The fate of the silhouettes was unhappy in that when he got ready to go home to France in 1849, he took all of his volumes. Uh, he made these in duplicates, by the way. I'm going to show you an example here in just a moment. Uh, he made these in duplicates so that as he cut out the full figure, I mean, he used a piece of paper that had been prepared with a black coating, folded it in half, and then he worked, he scissored from the back side, the blank side. So then when you opened it up, you know, you had a mirror image, one of the other. You had two images. You got one for 25 cents, and he kept the other. He kept them, and then he eventually also put them down in albums. And I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. But the fate of the profiles, or the silhouettes, was that um, as he was going home in 1849 on a ship that had set sail from, from New York City, they were within, eye, we were within sort of eye shot, you know, just a few hundred yards off of the coast of the Isle of Guernsey, which is technically part of the United Kingdom, but you know it's closer to France and so forth and so on. It was a squall, it was a hurricane, the ship went down, and everything was lost. And his albums had all been crated in big, beautiful, Brazilian mahogany 
casks which that had been tarred and wrapped and so forth. Well, when the ship went to the bottom, it wasn't all that far down. You know, it was 150 feet or something like that. So, of course, there was a salvage operation and all the other things in the ship. I mean, every, most everything was brought up. Uh, half of his great casks came up. The other half did not and have never been found. So what we know about his work in America is the first half. It's 1839 to 1844. We don't have any record of 1844 to 1849. That's somewhere at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. But when these were retrieved and salvaged and unwrapped, they were perfectly dry and perfectly preserved. They had been so carefully you know, prepared in these, in these great wooden chests and so forth. So those were later recovered by a collector and, and numbered and disseminated and so forth and so on. And that uh, really is the substance of the exhibition. It consists mainly of these full-length silhouettes. And as you can see, I don't know if you can read that, this is the former President John Quincy Adams, um, as it is, let's see if I can do that, yeah, as it is uh, labeled here with the date of 18 March, eight, uh, 11 March, 1841. And down here, then there's more kind of biographical information. Typical of Edouard's silhouettes is the insertion of that little white collar, which indicates the man's shirt. Other silhouettes typically did not do that, uh, but it is a way that today's fakers and people who forge silhouettes, they always add a little collar. You know, they always put the little white collar in, trying to make it look like an, an example by Edouard. So the exhibition that you will come to see has one large gallery filled with these, and they're all sorts of fascinating personalities from the 19th century, from the world of politics, art, um, history, architecture, military figures, all sorts of people, men and women both. Um, it reflects the personality, I guess I would say, of the pre-Civil War society, even in the East, in that it is not very racially diverse. Almost all of these people are uh, in Boston, Phil Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, Baltimore. Those are the cities he worked in, and virtually all of them are prominent, uh, prominent white folks who were in one of these different fields, medicine and poetry, all sorts of uh, people are included. So that's what you'll see if you come over and have a look at the exhibition. Many of them are laid down on lithographs like this. Which, which gives us the illusion of an interior, you know, as if this is John Quincy Adams standing in a very elegantly appointed room with lots of books and so forth and so on. Those are, those are lithographs, and the artist would, would have a whole stack of each one of his backgrounds, and the one that he stuck you down on wasn't up to you. You know, that's, that was the way that the, he created his albums. Nor were you given the choice of who you got paired with, because in many instances, it's not just one figure, it might be two. Let's see if I can, hmm. Oh, I'm trying to talk to that, aren't I? No, that was too much. Okay. Um, this is an example. I wanted to show you these. This is um, by another artist whose surname is Fischbach, as you can see, a German silhouette, as you can see down below. On the right is uh, Monsieur uh, Edouard himself, a self-portrait, you can see the kind of the technique because there he is putting the last finishing little snippets on that double, on that double profile. So the one that he holds, or that's sort of upright from our orientation, you can see man has a top hat. Well, the top hat's at the bottom on the one on the bottom because it's been made by opening up a sheet of paper that had been folded and then the outline cut. He didn't make preliminary drawings. He would sometimes use like a ruler and just kind of sketch in the lines of proportions, but he didn't make preliminary drawings, or so it is said. And these profiles were cut impromptu, straight away. You would just, you know, sit or stand before him and boom, there he'd go. And 15 minutes later, the he'd have the finished product. That's why I was able to do literally thousands upon thousands over the course of his career. Ah, this is the woman who salvaged the albums that had gone to the bottom of the sea. <laughs> and here she is in 1923, as you can see, it's a little profile of her, uh, Frances Neville Jackson, uh, an English woman, 
for whom this was not a hobby but an obsession, uh, the collecting of profiles and cataloging them and putting them in books and so forth and so on. It looks rather like Agatha Christie, right? You know, I mean, it's uh, because it's, it's uh, 19, 1923 in London. And this is the catalog that she created. This is the one that belongs to us at the museum. It's only eight and a half by 11. I mean, it's a little tiny thing, which contains information about 3,800 of the silhouettes that he made while in America. Those were the ones, that's what she found in the volumes from those first five years of 1839 to 1844. She came up with 3,800. Of course, there were many more that he probably didn't put down in those, that he, didn't, he hadn't put into those albums. These just happened to be, be the ones that were, that were there. And I wanted to show you, there it is again, but I wanted to show you, um, this is what it looks like on the inside. And this is uh, gigantically magnified, as you can imagine, because the point size of the print is tiny. And the people, the sitters, the names are all listed alphabetically. Well, in one respect that's helpful, in another respect it's not. <laughs> Because if you are like me, I might, I might, you know, I wish there was a concordance to this, both by date and by place. I want to know where did the person come from, where were they when he took their profile, what, what was the date, and when they're alphabetical like this, you know, you, it, it helps you look alphabetically, you can look them up that way, but you can't say, hmm, I wonder how many people he, he portrayed in Natchez in 1844. Well, you can't look that way because that's just not the, that's not the way the information has been dissected. And surely in these uh, days, you know, surely that wouldn't be so terribly difficult to do, would it? I mean, wouldn't, couldn't some computer program <laughs> go through and, you know, and sort this out and make it a little bit easier? So I wanted to point this out to you to tell you that it's far from being a perfect creature, this catalog. There are numerous probably transcription mistakes. There are probably numerous typesetting mistakes. And then there are times where you can see, oh, okay, you can imagine there she is organizing all these names, and she gets to the bottom of the MCs, and she realizes, oh, God, you know, McCade went before McGee or something, and they've got it the wrong way around. So you just have to live with those things. But what I wanted to point out to you was these names right here, M-C-G-E-B-E-E. -E -E. Of course, it should be M-C-G-E-H-E-E. -E -E. These are the McGees of Woodville. And this is, of course, where they lived, the McGees, on the great plantation called Bowling Green, southwest, um, south and east of Woodville a little bit. Here's the date on which Edward took their portraits. What it doesn't tell you was that he was never in Woodville himself. The artist was never there. These were made in New Orleans because I can find, I can find examples in the catalog that are the day before, the day of, and the day after. And this is all in New Orleans because so many Natchez people, as you know, went to New Orleans for the season, for the social season, the carnival season. They had their other houses down there, and so many of the Natchez sitters were actually portrayed in New Orleans, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Just wanted to kind of show you what the inside of this catalog is, um, which is wonderful to have, but its usefulness is a little bit limited. Okay, here are some of the, the Natchez folks that he that he portrayed, and he encountered people from Natchez long before he ever came to Mississippi, or at least a few years, because this one, as you can see up here, this man on the left, whoa, sorry, boom, boom. Uh, let's see if I can go back. No, it's only going forward. Hmm. Will it go in reverse, Chris? Will it actually back up? That's not it. <laughs> oh. One more. All right. No, no, that's too far. Uh huh. That right there. Okay. Side by side. All right, I'll try to be careful. Um, so, for example, in Washington in 1841, you saw the John Quincy Adams portrait. That was that was that was a moment when Edouard was in Washington, 
and this is, must be another one because you see the man, on the, the man on the left really has nothing to do with Natchez whatsoever. And that was done in 1839, as you can see up above, but the one on the right was done in 1841, June the 17th, 1841. And it describes that man as being of Natchez, which is sort of true, not really. I mean, he didn't come from Natchez, but he was living there for a while. And this is Joseph Holt Ingram. And many of you know of him as the author of this book, uh, whose, whose cover you can see on the right. Um, he was in and out of Mississippi over the course of his career. He ended up being the most prolific novelist, American novelist of the 19th century, but he was also a mystic and then decided to become a preacher, and so he had a couple of different um, parishes and so forth. Died in Holly Springs, where he was the, uh, the local rector, and um, unfortunately had a loaded gun and uh, fell, and it went off and killed him in the foyer of his own church. Um, how did uh, Edouard come to Natchez, and how did that happen? Well, it happened as a result of his connections in Philadelphia and New York with other artists, in particular with Thomas Sully, the great portraitist who is portrayed here on, the, on, the, on your left, as you can see. This is Edouard's portrait of Sully, made, I don't know if you can read it, uh, January the 3rd, 1843, inscribed both at the top and the bottom. The image on the right, that's the little portrait of Thomas Sully that belongs to us over at the museum. A little tiny miniature painting by a man called James Tooley Jr. And he was really the first kind of native-born artist in, in Natchez or in Adams County, maybe in, all of, you know, in Mississippi, for all practical purposes. But he had gone to Philadelphia to study with Thomas Sully. So as Edouard was cutting the silhouette, in other words, young Mr. Tooley was painting this picture of, uh, of Sully, and therefore that must, it must have been Sully's studio that was the meeting place for these people. And in the, later in the year, the image on the right, is Dr. Henry Tooley, young James's father, who was a famous physician, but also a cosmologist, an astronomer, an author. He taught... Um, at the college there in Wa Jefferson there in, in Washington, of course. And uh, so young Mr. Tooley, who had some kind of bronchial pneumonia, there was some kind of pulmonary problem, and he decided at Christmas of 1843 that he would go home to Natchez and invited Edouard to come with him because the young Mr. Tooley wanted to go home where Dad could, could treat him for his illness. Didn't work, died in August of the same year. Uh, as, it, as it happens. But on the right is an image of, the, of his father. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. So, in kind of in chronological order, some of the Natchez people that Edouard portrayed in New Orleans in that winter of 1843 to 44, one of them um, was the, or here we have numerous individuals, these are all people who are members of the family of Benjamin Farrar, young. Uh, they were related to everyone in Natchez, as was the case at that time, <laughs> with the, of the great houses and so forth. The families were very much intermarried, and so it gets interesting to follow the, the names and the numbers. And you know, of course, people died so young. There were many of these people had two and three wives or two and three husbands, and the connections change and overlap, and so tracing them and following them can be a challenge. But the patriarch, the man, the tall man in the middle, is Benjamin Farrar Young. And this is a, a group portrait of members of his family. It includes his spinster sister, but also then his children by both of his first two wives. And then the, uh, these individuals here in the center, on the left is his current wife, to whom the baby is being presented, as you can see, by the Nanny and Mr. and Mr. Young is there on the right. And I wanted to just show you this to, to say that, you know, these things don't exist in perfect state if they have remained with the families. I mean, this is the kind of object that stayed with the family forever, didn't go back to England or do anything, you know, with, with Edward. This stayed with the family as it is inscribed on the back and belongs to the historic New Orleans collection. But um, you'll see here that, that the mother is giving kind of a necklace or something 
to, uh, to the baby. And I think it must be, and yet part of it is missing. Can you see how some of it seems to have flaked off? And there are bits of it that um, at the very top that the child is reaching for something, but there's nothing there. Well, that little piece of paper has obviously has fallen away. And I think it must have been one of these, a piece of coral in a silver in a silver, uh, an embellished piece of silver jewelry, in a sense, which is a, a toother, teether, however that's meant to be pronounced, but something that a child whose teeth are just coming in would be given wear around their neck so they could gnaw on something. Um, all these people are buried in the same plot in Natchez. <laughs> so if you wonder what happened to the young family, you know, they are all together um, to this day in one of these sort of beautiful family, family plots fenced in the main cemetery. Uh, this is a fascinating man called, Wilton, uh, sorry, called William Newton Mercer, who uh, came to all the way down to New Orleans in 1816, and he kept a diary of that journey that took him all the way from Baltimore, Maryland, where he lived all the way to New Orleans. Fascinating how many different kinds of conveyances. One of the first people to come this far south on a steamship at that moment. Uh, this belongs to Lansdowne House. And so this too is one of those that this didn't go, this didn't get put down in an album and taken back to England. This is the only version of this that I know or been able to find and is in the possession of the, you know, of the folks at Lansdowne today, but is in our show at the, at the museum. Um, he was the, he inherited in a sense through marriage, he inherited Laurel Hill, which is one of the oldest, and down on the lower Woodville Road as you're heading out of, out of town, and he may have been the person who was responsible for the construction of this remarkable uh, chapel, St. Mary's, which is still there and still exists, and people use, I think, use it occasionally for weddings. Is that right? Is it still in use or can be, can be found? Uh, beautiful building. He died, he died childless. Uh, his wife died um, before he did, and then his daughter did as well. And living mostly in New Orleans, he became a great philanthropist and endowed many of the civic organizations, library, and all sorts of things, convent of the Ursuline nuns, and so forth in, um, in New Orleans. But a rather remarkable um, man who had come to prominence as a surgeon in the War of 1812 in Maryland, remember that's where Francis Scott Key lived and so forth, and, um, and then made his way down to New Orleans in 1816 and eventually married uh, Natchez. And it's one of the, I suppose it's, it goes without saying, but it's one of the things that becomes obvious to you if you're doing this kind of research through the years is that there was a great need for people out here in the Southwest, as it was called at the time, but for people in the territory and then in the state of Mississippi, they needed capable administrators of all kinds. They needed people who were talented in all sorts of fields and endeavors, whether it was medicine or, or as landscapers or surveyors, military men, but they particularly needed you know, teachers for colleges and they needed doctors and so forth. Attracted a lot of people like, um, like Mr. Mercer to this part of the world. And you know, almost all of them, funny how this happens, they all married rich, rich widows. <laughs> they, they came out here and they found either, or they found, you know, girls who happened to be the, the heirs because there weren't any boys or something. And so in many instances, these men who came, from, who came from Boston, New York, Philadelphia primarily, they made their way out here and uh, found kind of fame and fortune, you know, out on the, out on the frontier. Mimi Miller always, <clears throat> always said to me it was, three, it was three types. It was lawyers preachers and politicians, and they were all rascals, you know, and they were all looking, they were all money, money digging. Uh, this shows you uh, an original frame. This is what these things look like if they have remained in the absolutely untouched original frame. This is how you would see it at Lansdowne today. It's how you see it over in our corridor at the moment. And here I'm showing you um, the way that Edward signed so many of these, and he used the convention of, of the... Latin word fake it, F-E-C-I-T. So this, I know it's hard to see. The, this is where the moths got in. 
And so this is A-U-G-S-T for August Edward, E-D-O-U-A-R-T, F-E-C-I-T. Now you see this was made in New Orleans. Here's the N, and here's Orleans, Orleans, February the 20th, 1844. So that's in February. He's still in New Orleans. And now when we come to, this is Mr. McGee. We talked about his... Uh, the ones that were in the book a moment ago, labeled February the, the 20th, and you can see both down here at the bottom and up here at the top, it says um, Woodville again, but down at the bottom, it explains that yet it was made in New Orleans. So he's from Woodville, but cut in New Orleans on February the 22nd. Um, that may be easier for you to see a little bit. This is an interesting example. See, these two men really don't have anything to do with one another except that they were both judges. And so Edouard, compi com compiling his catalog, put them in the same book. So here you have Thatcher, the judge of the Supreme Court. This was Natchez, April the 30th, and then Judge McGee. So made within weeks, but you know, not at the same time, not on the same day. Um, McGee was one of the founders, was one of the really principal movers of the Mississippi colonizing enterprise that were, that were trying to organize land in what today we would call, call Liberia in West Africa for, for freedmen that wanted to return. Uh, that's the map of that territory. He, uh, he built the great house called Bowling Green uh, Plantation south of Woodville. He, was, um, uh, he opposed secession. He wanted, uh, he wanted to remain in the Union, but he had a factory on his property that produced textiles, which were used to make uniforms for the Confederate Army. Therefore, when they came through, <laughs> this house was destroyed, was burnt, and this is all that's left uh, are, these, are these columns of the house. Now, uh, here's his, a little bit of his obituary that praises him as a very sort of, you know, um, honorable and upstanding patriarch of the family and this, that, and the other. This is, out of the, this is out of the Vicksburg paper a few days after he died, lived to be the venerable age of 94 or 95. It's a little bit shaky right in there, not quite sure of his birth date because he'd been born far away. And you can see the cemetery on the property still remains. The McGee's, lots of McGee's are buried in that, in that lovely cemetery, which is still there on the, on the property. And when I went there the other day, um, oh, here's his head, headstone. And um, had lived in Wilkinson County for 72 years, it tells us. So you see, he came really as a very young man. He followed that route that many did from North Carolina to Virginia, or West Virginia, down through Tennessee, into, into Mississippi. There's the headstone. But when I visited there not so long ago, I found out that if you wanted to, you could, you could be, if you were related or had the right connections, you could still be buried there. Or at least there's this sign right, out, you know, right outside the, the entrance that explains that here are the modern day owners and so forth and so on. And if any of you have the nerve, uh, give them a call and explain to them how to spell descendants. See, see if you see the word there, we've got a little bit of a spelling hiccup, but um, nonetheless, I just thought that was fascinating, you know, that outside this locked and gated cemetery, which clearly is beautifully kept, so there's somebody that's keeping it up, I mean, whether it's them or whether it's Wilkinson County, I don't know, but it's a lovely property. But I love the fact that, you know, you can ring them up and explain to the, these two why it is that you think you deserve to be buried <laughs> with, with all the McGee's, so fine. Um, I'm almost finished. Uh, here are the, the Tooley's. We come back to the, the name Tooley, T-O-O-L-E-Y. This is James Sr., for whom James Jr., the artist, the one who painted the little miniature, he was actually named for his uncle. So this is James Sr., and this is his father, Henry, as we revisit. That's exactly the same one I showed you a moment ago that has the, uh, here, you may be able to see that a little bit better. Magnified, it gets a little blurry, I think, but you can probably see it, it says Dr. H. Tooley, MD, 
born in 1773, and so this was done in Natchez on the 24th of April, 1844. Now, so far as I have been able to determine from studying the catalog and what exists in terms of these cuttings in different museums, Edouard was in, was in Natchez only one week. I mean, it was only from April the 23rd until April the 30th, 1844. So all the examples from Natchez were cut literally within those six days because by May the 10th, he's in Louisville. And then by June the 6th, he's back in Philadelphia. And then by the end of June, he's gone to Saratoga Springs, where he spent almost every summer because that was probably the source, the richest source of clients with people who had, you know, were on holiday in a sense and had money to spend. And that was one of those fun things to do, you know, while you're at Saratoga watching the horses and going to the springs is to go and have your portrait made. So many of them are, are done in Saratoga. And um, this character on the left, a Philadelphian, this is the man, Dr., uh, as you can see, Dr. Dickerson. This is the man who came to Natchez in the 18-teens and uh, associated with the University of Pennsylvania, where, as you know, they have a very great archaeological museum. And he's the one who began the systematic plundering of the mounds. <laughs> this fellow on the left and taking it all back to Philadelphia. So today, a great deal of what would have been found at the great village of the Natchez or in other mounds in Adams County, you know, it was like plunder. It's been taken back to either Philadelphia or a lot of it he donated to Boston, I mean to Harvard, which was his alumni. So you have the Peabody Museum and so forth and so on. We have him to thank. Uh, finally, there's another artist. I'm going to kind of go fast so you can ask some questions. This is a different artist who works in the same kind of genre, of course. This is William Henry Brown. And uh, he, <clears throat> he was very popular with politicians like Daniel Webster, whom you see here on the left. And on the right, we don't know this man's name. He didn't record it. It isn't anywhere inscribed on the artwork. But this is when he did a series of the legislators of the new state of Mississippi legislature. Uh, the only hitch is he did it 20 years after the fact because he, they were made in 1840, but they are portrayals of people who were in the 18, 18, 18, 19, 20 in that early uh, legislative period, he did their portraits. And the one, uh, the man on the right, we don't know his name, but what's so fascinating about it, um, I'll have to say, you'll just have to come over and put your nose on it. It's got glass, don't worry. You, know, you have to come over and have a look at it, but through that open window is the new state, is the old Capitol building, which I thought you all would enjoy <laughs> seeing, but it's so tiny, but that's what that is. Through that open window, this man is standing in a room whose location I can't tell you. Where would that be? I'm not sure, because he's, obviously it's to the north and west of the, of the old Capitol, right? So that's what that building is through the open door. Um, this is Duncan Stewart, who was the first governor of the state of Mississippi. And you can see that the lithograph, this again, there's a lithographic background, but, <clears throat> and all these legislators are placed on this same lithograph except for the one I showed you a moment ago. But uh, this is Natchez, is it not? I mean, this is the house called Clifton that doesn't exist anymore up there by the cemetery and so forth. And this you see, it's, a, it's, a, it's an anachronism because um, the basilica didn't exist in 1819. The basilica wasn't built until 18, what, 37, 38, 39, somewhere. This is St. Mary's, the, the steeple. But, and, and they're standing on the, I guess they're standing on the Vidalia side, right? You know, looking back across the river with the profile of the town because that surely was a skyline that everybody would instantly know, oh, that's Natchez. Um, So those are not without interest. Now, Brown did this fascinating, remarkable, and um, I think I won't say too much because, honestly, we could talk an hour about this one, you know, alone, showing a kind of a, a street performance, as it were, of a man probably, and it's entitled, by the way, The Master Plays the Violin While His Valet Dances, is written in a contemporaneous hand uh, in the bottom margin. So clearly what we have here people who have either paid two bits or are just being entertained uh, by a man playing the violin while a man of, 
of African American origin, you know, dances. Finally, let's see. There we go. Oh, I guess you can maybe see that um, fairly well. I wasn't sure whether that, there aren't, really aren't very good images of this. This is one of five panels that belong to the historic New Orleans collection. They're all large in scale, and they're about the size of the seat of the chairs on which you are, on, are sitting. And they form a procession. And uh, when they were acquired by the historic New Orleans collection about 12 years ago, uh, nobody seemed to know exactly the order. In other words, this woman seated on a black horse, which isn't moving at the moment, does she belong at the beginning or does she belong, you know, she's supposed to be the first of five or is she five of five? And how that is to be organized. So um, I'm going to show you the rest and it's obvious how the procession is meant to go. Curiously, it proceeds from, from right to left. I mean, almost always in Western art, we read from left to right, obviously, you know, because, I mean, the angel Gabriel never comes in from the right. The angel Gabriel always comes from the left, and the light comes from, you know, down from the left, because that's the way we read. Chinese art is the opposite. The action happens from right to left, but in Western art, everything happens from left to right. Well, so we're not quite sure whether she's leading or following, but what we do know is that she is Sarah Pierce Vick, born in Louisville, but then married the Vic as in Vicksburg be, um, between the War of 1812 and, and 1820 and came out here, established a family. Her husband became fantastically successful and they lived at a place called Nitayuma, which is not far from Anguilla. Is that the right pronunciation? Anguilla? Um, in, the, in the Delta. And it was, so, it was so successful that it really was a town of its own. Had a post office, there, eventually there was a railway stop. You know, it had six churches. <laughs> if you can imagine, and if you go there today, it's more or less a ghost town. There's hardly anything left. In any event, come and look at these. They're big and they're fascinating. They're a little different than those silhouettes because they really are collages. Each of these pieces has been cut out separately and either painted or cut from different paper to give it all this, this wide range of colors. So the horse and, and her figure and this, that, and the other, they are all applied, and so you can tell there's a kind of three-dimensionality to the artwork. Um, oh, that's what's kind of, that's, you know, the original house is there somewhere. Uh, it's, a, it's been modified over the years, but this is the plantation house on the Nidayuma property. There's the series. And so you can see the first two, in other words, they go one, two, three, four. And then wherever you want to put her on the horse, whether she goes at the front or the back, I'm not quite sure, but it seems to me that the, mis the plantation mistress taking all of this cotton to market, I don't think she's going to ride at the back in the dust and the smell of the manure. You know, I just kind of don't think, I think she's at the front, not the back, but this is unknown. So all these four pieces, these four panels are all separate, and, uh, but obviously from the way that the artist applied the words at the top, you know, the clearly, like I say, one, two, three, four. So they are heading from right to left, and it fills half of a corridor. You know, they're quite spectacular. So come and see them if you have any interest in it. Um, I love the dogs, uh, which, as you can see, are cut from the same model. The dog, they're different color, but the same shape. <laughs> the tail's in the same place, you know, that, that sort of thing. And um, you all, we also, of course, would know how to arrange them, because if you look at numbers three and four, which are the conclusion, the horse or donkey, his body is in the panel on the left, but his tail is in the panel on the right. So that's obviously how they were meant to fit, you know, to fit together. And uh, this, there's no, there's no silhouette of this, but I just wanted to sort of remind you, if you're trying to tie this all up in your head, Sarah Pierce Vick, she's the one who's, um, no, I want to go that way. There, that's it. Uh, she's the one who's, you know, impossibly handsome son, Henry Gray Vick is the one that went off to Mobile and, and had that unfortunate uh, duel with the man who refused to put his gun into the, into the air and uh, was killed on, 
uh, his 24th birthday, and was this is the boy on the on the left hand side, and was meant to marry the woman called Helen Johnstone, who later married an Episcopalian preacher, and he built this house called Mount Helena for her at uh, Rolling Fork on an Indian mound, which is the way that photograph is. So you know it's it's true in Mississippi. As a foreigner, I've learned everything comes back around. <laughs> there's some way, there's a way to tie up all the, you know, all these, all these stories. So of course the house is still there. You know, it was made into a movie. This whole drama, of the of the of the youngsters about to be married, and then the boy is killed in the duel, and so forth and so on. And the um, uh, the name today, after many generations, they are still there. But the surname is Phelps. Uh, because they married back into Louisville society, in a sense, and the name was Phelps. All right, that's all I have for you today, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer. You'll raise your hand, we'll bring the microphone to you. Okay. What was the actual procedure in creating a silhouette? Well, there are, you know, there are various techniques. And you could use different colors of paper. You could, uh, sometimes they are the hollow cut, meaning it's the, you take the piece of paper and I'm cutting out the profile because as with Bache, the man who put them down in the album, what he was interested in was the actual profile itself. But what you, the customer, wanted was the piece of paper with the, with the outline. And then you could take that home and you could lay that down on fabric. You could lay that down on a painted board. You could lay that down on you know, whatever you wanted, any other kind of surface. And so the image is what shows through. But tech, or much more typical, more traditional. You've seen people doing it, I'm sure, in the course of life, and, and um, we've had some silhouette artists come to the museum and demonstrate how this is, this is done, and most people start by making a sketch, and then they, you know, and then they cut it out, and there you are. Edouard, as I um, mentioned, would start with large size pieces of paper, and which were then coated, not by him, but he would, at an artist's studio, these would be coated with a substance that resembled pitch from the fireplace. You know, it's a kind of inky stuff that will, that will give you a very, very black surface. And then fold that in half and cut from the back. And snip, snip, snip with those little embroidery scissors and so forth until you, until you have the finished image. And then, you know, you open it up and one more cut separates them, whether it's at the feet or the head, and then you've got two. So that's how Edouard worked. That's why he had one for him, one for you. One for him, he put assembled in those albums, one for you, you did whatever you want with it. And that's why some, like the one at Lansdowne, for example, that never went anywhere. That just always stayed with the family there at Lansdowne, and so it is today. Uh, I, I, I'm curious about the, the latter, um, Ladder pictures had shadow. How, how did the at the shadow? It had to be afterwards. Yes, many of them. Yes, I mean whether it's William Henry Brown or it was Edouard, very often you'll get these fairly rudimentary kind of conical shaped shadows under their feet. You know that indicate that we're on solid ground here, and there's a shadow, and that's simply a matter of what you and I would call ink wash. So if you had a bottle of India ink, you'd probably dilute it a lot, and then very carefully paint that on, because you're just painting it onto the onto the paper. Remember, those backgrounds are all those backgrounds are all lithographs. So those fancy interiors or the outdoor scenes or whatever, those have already been printed onto the sheet of paper. So you're just applying a little bit of wash with a brush to the sheet of paper. Not hard. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, the period that you're talking about, or, um, 19th century, at that time, um, slaves were considered 
three quarters of a person. Slavery time, slaves were three quarters of a person. And uh, is there any way that slaves were depicted as three quarters of a person um, in, in this time when there's no um, photography? I don't think that the ratio, I don't think the proportion of three quarters or 75%, I don't think that figured into anybody's calculation. I think the fact is that they just weren't depicted at all. You know, there was just not, they, they most often were not people with independent means to pay for such a thing. And it probably, in many families, wouldn't have been considered, um, you know what, it wouldn't have been considered necessary or even appropriate. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, others, I think others even here in this audience could probably answer that better. What I do know is that in, in the, all 3,800 of the persons that Auguste Edouard depicted, at least so far as we know from the ones that are recorded in that little green book, there are only seven out of the 3,800, there are only seven who are enslaved persons. And normally, we don't know their name. I mean, occasionally, he, Edouard, or someone, you know, went to the trouble of writing down, it will simply say, uh, you know, it'll have the names of the various family members, and then it'll say, William, comma, slave, or Annie, comma, slave. So they are identified, but by a first name only. I, I don't really know much more, I don't know much more about how to address the proportionality or the ratio question. Anybody else want to take that on? Were the templates from the cutouts used, like, as patterns for quilts or... Other things like that? Of the actual silhouettes themselves? I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. It probably, if they existed, if, if, it's, if it's the hollow cut, if it's the kind where the image is cut out of the piece of paper, yeah, then you've got something you could, with a piece of graphite or chalk, you know, you could make a rubbing. You could actually put it down on a blank sheet of paper and make sort of a rubbing, and then you'd have a, and then you would have a, a, a hole head or figure rather than, rather than just the outline. I haven't, I haven't seen anything like that, though. But I'm not a collector of these. <laughs> I mean, if you all are interested in this, I mean, you, you can imagine that like, like most things in life that are subject to eBay and everything else, there's a whole world of, of silhouette collectors, and the websites are just legion, and you don't want to get involved in an argument with any of them. I promise you, because you know you can't begin to know what they forgot 25 years ago. So don't even try that. That's not a, that's not a good plan. But they they um, they are still avidly collected, and uh, there are whole. I don't even know how to describe it except to say that there are hierarchies <laughs> of these things and of people who call themselves experts. And I, I mean, fine, good, I'm glad you are. You know, that's, nobody's going to debate that. That's good. Um, but I don't, it's not like you go to get a degree in that or something. Um, but nonetheless, if you look at some of their websites, oh, it gets vicious. You know, I mean, the, the arguing back and forth. And because there are people who appoint themselves as the arbiters of, of, of autograph, you know, the autograph, autograph meaning authentic, of authenticity, so there's one person, and all she does her whole life long, bless her heart, you know, she goes through all, every time there's an auction of silhouettes at Doyle's or Christie, whatever, she spends the next three weeks proving they aren't right. <laughs> you know, she goes through and explains in fascinating detail how this one's not right. Oh, more fakes. Oh, more fakes. More Edouard fakes. Fakes, 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 fakes. So that's, that's what she does with her Tuesdays. <laughs> Is there a known number of artists that do this today? I don't know, but you know there probably is some kind of registry. I wouldn't be surprised, and it may be, it may be that they have their own society as members of the American Antiquarian Society or something. I wouldn't be surprised. I know years ago I went to Disney World and we had ours done by yeah. an artist there, so there must be some kind of group uh, or that are preserving that 
technique, I guess. Oh, well, they're, they're all over the place. I mean, and there are plenty of them here in Mississippi. You encounter them, I mean, go to the Canton Street Fair or something like that, you know, I mean, you encounter them every, everywhere, and they're good. I mean, they're, they're really talented. Oh, really? Oh, okay, good, see, there we are. But whether, well, then you, let me ask you this. <laughs> Is there some way that, does this, does this amorphous group or this large group, is there some way that people try to give licenses or? Not that I know of. And there are a lot of, if you go online looking for silhouettes, there are miles Dozens. and miles of people. Exactly, yeah. And a lot of them do communicate, I guess, with each other. But I, I'm personal, local. <laughs> they, they blog. You're, you know what I mean? They, they set up their sites, and then you can, you can read down, oh, from now till next Christmas, you know, you can sit and sort of read all the comments that people put up. So-and-so is doing portraits yeah. little shops all over. Yep. Yeah. This Kind of like they did it then. I mean, sort of like Edouard going from town to town where he would either rent a hotel room, or better yet, he would get somebody to put him up. And while during that week that he was in Natchez, he was, in, he was at, a, at a hotel that, uh, on, on Canal Street. That I was able to kind of find out about. And he just you know, rented a room and put out a sign, and, and all, these, all these people showed up, you know, and away, away he went. He probably could have done many more, but only was there, as, I, as far as I've been able to determine, it was just there one week, and then had to get on the way, you know, back up the river. True. Or, yeah, or wheels or kilns. Or, no, no, you can just sort of pick it up and go. Well, and, and so, uh, this putting her on the spot. So, is there anything you'd like to correct? I'm very curious, the two self-portraits you showed of Mr. Fishback and, yep. and Edward, both show them cutting left-handed. So were they, was that the other half of the pair of doubles? Or on the other hand, the, um, the one of Brown's fiddle player yep. is correct. So he must have cut that from the black side. Oh, I don't think I don't think Brown ever did the double cutting. And he must have cut from the from, from the from the black side, most likely. Yes, I'm sorry. I just didn't want to take time. Yeah, no. So Edouard is the only one that I know of who did the fold the paper in half and cut from the blank side, and then you have two black ones. Um, I also know how they did self portrait because you can't see the profile. What? <laughs> in the mirror while you're cutting your hand off. Yeah, you know, so. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's interesting about Edouard is that he had, as a young man, he had a, he had a, a fishing accident, and one of the fingers of his, of his hand was literally almost torn off. And um, so how he managed to, you know, it, it either grew back or they cut the rest of it off, I don't know which. <laughs> But it was a fishing hook problem, and so it ripped and it tore the tendons, and so forth. And how he managed then to manipulate the scissors, I think, is a mystery. You know, even even today. Absolutely. Well, how long is the ex uh, how long are the exhibitions up at the art museum? Until August the twenty fourth. So you've got a, a little while. I'm gonna make a point of getting down there. This was a fabulous program. I hope we see you back next week. Help me thank Roger Ward for this today. <laughs>